Welcome, you're watching Vox News, your daily news updates with Rita Kumo. Our headlines today, Nigerians stage fresh anti-government protests, voicing criticism of President Muhammadu Buhari. Namibia plans to establish special courts dealing with physical and sexual violence against women. Rwanda approves the cultivation, processing and export of cannabis for medical purposes. Our top story today, hundreds of Nigerians on Tuesday gathered at Lekki Toll Gate in Lagos as part of anti-government protests in conjunction with continuing demonstrations against police brutality across several cities. In general, it's not a SAS only anymore. It's not a SAS anymore. There is hunger in the land. Economy is poor. There is no light. There is no road. There is no water. Banditry in the north. Kidnapping in the north. Militants are fighting. Then what do we what do we voted you for? We voted you to, for you to bring that change to us. As I'm speaking to you now, we go, you can go around right around and discover you discover that there is no light, there is no power. We don't want this old old ban in government anymore. They should go away and leave it for the youth. This is the time for the youth. The youth are sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm going to stay here as long as it takes, man. As long as it takes. Okay? I'm doing this for my brother, I'm doing this for my unborn kids. I'm doing this for my son. How long have you been here? I came here yesterday. This is my second time here. I think we're going to have shifts like morning, afternoon, and night. People are still going to keep coming. The demonstrations were channeling anger among the youth over unemployment, economic mismanagement, poverty, and corruption in the country. In Namibia, Prime Minister Sarah Amadila on Tuesday announced that the country plans to establish special courts to deal with physical and sexual violence against women. The news comes after the authorities recorded a high number of sexual and gender-based violence in recent years. The Prime Minister said that the country is in full agreement that the issue of sexual violence is on the rise and that the situation cannot be allowed to continue. The decision came in response to a petition that was handed over to Parliament last week as part of a four-day protest against sexual and gender-based violence in the country. Rwanda has approved cannabis production and export for medical purposes. The Rwanda Development Board said on Tuesday evening that the government would issue licenses for cultivating cannabis for medical use. This follows Monday's cabinet decision to approve the regulatory guidelines on the cultivation, processing and export of high-value therapeutic crops. Rwanda will begin to receive applications for licenses from investors interested in cannabis, though its consumption in the country remains prohibited. The Minister of Health, Daniel Nkamidje, specified that the growing of medical cannabis would, however, solely be for export markets. He added that the government hopes to generate substantial export revenues and employment opportunities in high-value agriculture and agro-processing. In Cameroon, United Nations rights experts are calling for the release of opposition leader Maurice Camto from house arrest for calling for peaceful protests against longtime ruler Paul Biya. The organization on Monday issued a statement urging Camto's release and that of dozens of others reportedly arrested during demonstrations on the 22nd of September. According to the organization's statement, Camto's house arrest could amount to a deprivation of liberty in violation of his rights to freedom of peaceful assembly and association, as well as liberty and security of person. Camto said on Tuesday that he remained sequestered at his home with a police unit outside his house blocking his driveway. In Guinea, opposition leader and presidential candidate Selou Dalen Djalo on Tuesday said that supporters of President Alpha Conde blocked him from entering the country's second city to campaign ahead of the looming elections. 
Malheureusement, Alpha Unfortunately, Condé... Alpha Condé decided that I should not go strutting around in his strongholds, and so all arrangements were made to prevent me from accessing this great city of Cancan. We experienced the blockage together when we went to Cancan. We found these young people with the tree trunks, with this vehicle that blocked our way. I had to make a difficult decision to turn back because I didn't want confrontations there. I didn't want confrontations. And as you noted, the young people were excited. They were becoming more and more numerous. We could have, with my men, forced the dam and passed through. The obstacle was not insurmountable, but we might have had to fight. I really didn't want to fight against these innocent young people who were used by the authorities. Guinea's main opposition leader is set to face his longtime rival, 82 year old Conde, on Sunday. Meanwhile, in Guinea, President Alpha Conde held a rally on Monday before Sunday's elections, in which he is hoping for a third term in office. They have come to tell you that I am sick, that I am lying down, that I can't get up, so I'm sick, I'm sick. I told my activists that I don't want violence, that I don't want you throwing stones, insulting people, don't block the roads. We are proud of our independence and sovereignty and I do what the people of Guinea want. If we are here today, it is simply to prove to Professor Alpha Conde that he is someone who above all advocates peace in our country and also someone who wants progress in our country and who also seeks to integrate youth in the development process. After 10 years in office, the 82-year-old president is running for a disputed third term on Sunday, despite deadly protests against his re-election bid. A new corruption scandal is making headlines in Malawi. A high court in the capital Lilongwe on Tuesday convicted former Home Affairs Minister Uladi Musa for unlawfully giving passports and citizenship to foreigners when he was serving in Joyce Banda's administration between 2012 and 2014. The former Home Affairs Minister was found guilty of abuse of public office, neglect of duty and altering false documents alongside former regional immigration officer David Kwangjana. Both men were arrested in 2017 by Malawi's Anti-Corruption Bureau for illegally granting citizenship to Burundians. In Tunisia, a court on Tuesday announced the death of 21 migrants over the weekend in a boat that sank off the coast of the country. The boat had been carrying 29 people, including two Tunisians and other migrants from sub-Saharan Africa. Seven survivors were rescued on Sunday and a total of 21 bodies have now been retrieved. According to Sfax Court spokesman Murad Turki, there is little hope to find the remaining missing passenger. The Turkish authorities said that they foiled 32 attempts to cross the Mediterranean and arrested 262 migrants between Saturday night and Sunday morning alone. In Libya, the United Nations on Monday urged the country's rival leaders to prioritize the national interest over political ambitions in the upcoming inter-Libyan dialogue aimed at ending nearly a decade of civil war. That I make it a condition for anyone to participate in this dialogue that they remove themselves from consideration in uh, high government positions. That includes the Presidency Council, the Premiership, uh, the Ministers and Sovereign positions. So. Um, you know, the people who will be present, and they are representing really the diversity of Libya. It's a, a appropriate presence for the members the, of the House of Representatives and the Higher State Council. These are the, the bodies that emerged from uh, through the Skirat uh, Libyan political agreement. We need them in the dialogue because they have to also shoulder their responsibilities towards this new period in Libya. The inter-Libyan political dialogue is scheduled to take place in neighboring Tunisia in early November. 
Tunisia supports a dialogue between Libyans directly without interference. Tunisia's role is to accompany the Libyan brothers in order to reach consensus that could establish a modern state in the nearest future. The talks, which will include representatives from civil society, political leaders and members of bodies representing both administrations, are intended to prepare for national elections. In Senegal, the historic Gore Island reopened on Saturday after months of closure due to the coronavirus pandemic. Visitors were pleased to walk around the former house of slaves turned tourist attraction. It's a bit creepy to come and look at this place after such a pandemic. It's beautiful anyway. In any case, I appreciate it, even though the atmosphere is not the same as when I came here nine months ago. Gori residents were pleased to see tourists return to the island, especially after seven months of economic inactivity. We suffered a lot. There was no work. And this is a tourist spot for people who come here. We did not work anymore. My mother is a tour operator. She sells necklaces. But thank God, Gori's town hall helped the young people and artists who were here. She gave them money. Seeing tourists again brings the island back to life because Gori has always had a lot of people. It's a tourist place where when there are no tourists, you feel like a small isolated village. So the fact that people come back, it comforts us. Maybe it can restart economic activities such as restaurants and many other things. That the island as a whole remained closed for seven months, that I stayed seven months without working, in addition to paying my staff for seven months, it's a dark time for an investor. Une période sombre pour un investisseur. Visitors who usually jam the 28 hectare island during peak hours were able to return in smaller numbers and had to comply with COVID-19 safety measures. That's it for today. Thank you for watching Vox News.